What is diversity? What is diversity? What is diversity? What is diversity? What is spirituality? What is spirituality? This is Angelo John Lewis for the Diversity and Spirituality Network podcast. And for those of you that don't know, the Diversity and Spirituality Network consists of a network of people that explore actively the intersection between diversity and spirituality. Um, Sometimes we talk more about spirituality, most sometimes we talk more about diversity, but in general, the subject of this podcast is the integration of the two things. And for those of you that enjoy the podcast, I would like to invite you to leave us a review on iTunes because that helps us spread the word so that other people might perhaps listen and get something um, out of this. And today I'm honored to be speaking with Reverend Kim Walczewski the pastor of the Universalist Unitarian Church in Washington Crossing, and my pastor, which feels like a stretch to say, because as those who know me will tell you, I am a relatively unchurched individual. But that just goes to show you how much respect I have for this woman. I'll just tell you a little bit about Reverend Kim, and I'll call her Kim. She doesn't mind, I don't think. That's right. She's had, uh, she's been involved with the UU. She grew up in the church. She's been a minister for congregational life at the UU Church in Summit, New Jersey. All these sorts of things that she's she's done, and I'm not even going to go into them because it's suffice to say that she is a powerful young woman. Um, at the risk of doing a microaggression type thing here, it's like I first saw her preach. I was introduced by a friend to this church. And I'm thinking, boy, that's a little woman, but she packs a powerful punch. (laughs) (laughs) So I'll tell you a little bit more about Kim, which will be relevant to our topic. Um, Kim and her partner, Tara Walczewski, I know I messed it up, and, and you, you, you're you saying it, it up. perfectly I, because you're because you are saying it, Angelo. I'm, <laughs> thank you. I'm thrilled at the way it's coming out. <laughs> her and her and um, Tara, they had a civil union and a wedding in in March of 2013. Got an official marriage license in October of that year, after the change in New Jersey law permitted them to do so. And they have a wonderful child whom I've met named Tobias. And uh, what I've just learned recently is that they are with child for the second one. And um, boy, what a blessing. Blessing. And I, I'm going to say also that they have a dog named Wrigley, named after the, the Cubs. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway uh, welcome to the podcast, Reverend Kim. Thank you, Angelo. It's quite a privilege to hear you call me your pastor. So I'm, I'm going to tuck that one in my pocket, I think. I'm shocked that I did it myself. <laughs> it just sort of rolled, rolled out. <laughs> I always like to get started with these things by asking people a little bit about their own spiritual and religious background. So if you could just tell me a little bit about your own heritage. Sure. Um, as you mentioned, I was raised Unitarian Universalist. Um, on the very eastern end of the North Fork of Long Island to two uh, Catholic-raised parents and the lineage outside, you know, going, extending outside of my, my two parents, um, they were all Catholic in, in all of those, in, in each space outside of that. So it was quite a deviation for them to become Unitarian Universalist. I believe the story goes that my oldest brother was baptized Presbyterian, then my middle brother was baptized Lutheran, and then the young woman Unitarian Universalist minister was called to the local congregation. It was announced in the newspaper, and that's how they discovered the tradition. And that's where I was raised. Um, When I was about 10, the congregation split um, because of issues around um, how the minister was going to be asked to leave. My understanding of the story, at least, is that um, everyone was sort of on the same page, that the relationship was not right, but how 
that relationship ended caused division within the congregation. So my parents and a handful of others left the church and started their own Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, which meant that we met in um, classrooms, office spaces, family rooms, shared spaces with AA groups and the like. And we didn't have a minister. So uh, my father still cuts the lawn of the church and they did their own baby dedications and they share preaching, you know, from the pulpit. And I was, I was given this tradition by way of seeing it um, owned and articulated by lay people, essentially. And uh, which is interesting to, to know that by 16, I knew I was going to be a minister. Really? Because I had no model for what that meant. I just craved it, perhaps. Wow. Um, but uh, to say I was born and raised Unitarian Universalist is true. Um, but it's, it's also important to name that the way that I was um, given Unitarian Universalism, it was reactionary faith at the time, um, both within my own family unit and then in the maturity of the denomination or immaturity. Reactionary in what regard? Um, well, Unitarian Universalism is a relatively young faith. Unitarians and Universalists uh, were both Christian, yeah. right? They were both Christian denominations starting from, you know, who was Jesus? We can trace it back to, to then. Um, 1961, the two come together. And so if we're talking just 20 years later or so, when I'm introduced to the faith and and into the world, um, we're still figuring out who we are. And a lot of that, the answer to a lot of that is we are not this. So for my family unit and the way I was given the tradition was we are not Catholic. So why are we Unitarian Universalists? Because we're not Catholic. What is Unitarian Universalism? Well, we don't believe in, list all the things that we didn't like about Catholicism. We don't believe in sin. We don't believe in hell. We don't, it was a, it was a, um, an offering of negation rather than a faith of affirmation, which I was only, um, which I only really was given through my own learnings about the the faith and the tradition um, by way of religious education and um, then seminary and then through collegiality. Um, it was something that I had to grow into as the faith grew into holding that. So that you basically well. grew up in, in, to some extent, the formation of what, what I'm going to call the modern Unitarian Universalist Church. Absolutely, yes. And you mentioned that you recognized your ministerial calling fairly early. Could Mm -hmm. you say a little bit about that? (laughs) Um, It's not a grandiose story. Unfortunately, (laughs) I wish it was. I was 16 sitting upstairs in my room and um, playing around on the computer, which remembering this, I don't remember that I had a computer, but this is at least how the memory, how memory serves. And um, yeah, I found myself on the UUA website and looked up how to become a minister. And I was appalled. I was offended that it said that I had to go to college before seminary because at you know, the ripe age of 16, I thought certainly I was ready now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was, you know, was, looking back, I remember it as a moment of certainty and, um, it wasn't jolting. It wasn't surprising. It was just, Oh, Oh, that's what's going to happen. And then, of course, there was sort of an unraveling after that of realizing I had no idea what that meant. I had no model for what that looked like because I grew up in a mm, looking Lay, for, yeah, yeah. Um, but I was going to say abnormal, um, <laughs> <laughs> a, a unique religious environment. I was the only one in my entire high school who was Unitarian Universalist. Wow. So. It, I didn't learn the the typical religious upbringing like my Catholic and Jewish peers did. So when asked these, I, like I remember in high school, my senior year, we read Eleanor Rigby, you know, the Beatles song, but we read it as a piece of poetry. And I, I remember when my teacher said, Kim, you know, what do you, what do you think about that? Because he knew I wanted to go to seminary. Well, I... I didn't know. I didn't know that lines in that in that song talked about the loneliness of the priest or the fact that he prepared, if you recall the, sto- the song well enough, he prepared and prepared and prepared this, this sermon that nobody would hear. Well, that was either because nobody was in the pulpit or rather in the pews, or if that was because they just showed up and weren't listening. But, you know, that was something I had to grow into that part of the call would be also learning my own tradition, as well as the cultural um, language of religion. You're just you're basically talking about the um, 
sort of inchoate nature of formation with yeah. regard to the church and you. It's Absolutely. happening almost at the same time. Absolutely. It's happening exactly at the same time. Yeah. Now, I will tell you, I've already told you this. I was in church and I, you know, on the back of the handbill every 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 church there's these like seven rules or something 12 something seven or whatever. principles mm -hmm. i mean i have to be honest with you it's almost like bristol myers squibs or any a pharmaceutical company mm -hmm. it's like a group of people could have gotten together and said this is our guiding principles sure it was like so generic it was like you know it's like what are these people what what's up with this mm -hmm. you know and um so i mean we don't need to reference history but why don't you tell me in your own words what the essence of UU, and I'll call it that abbreviation, what, what is it for you? Well, so there are two, there are a couple of different things that you've just named in there. So, so one, you were talking about our seven principles, which are essentially, um, they are, they are words of covenant. So they help us learn how we are and, and um, guide us and how we are going to be in the world. They are about being in right relationship rather than being right. So we are a covenantal tradition, which means we are bound by promise rather than a creedal tradition, which is bound by belief. So if you look at the Catholics, okay. the Protestants, et cetera, right, they have a, a creed that says, uh, we believe in um, God the Father. Okay, so what you know already in that statement is that there is a God right? Right off the bat. And that that God is male. And then it continues on to say who the other important figures are, Jesus, who Jesus was or is, um, and how that person or or divine figure plays a role in our lives, the nature of uh, humanity and, and humanity's relationship with God, and that they're sin, all of these things all bound up in that I believe creed statement. So there's that, but there's also this other thing, right? Well, so that's that's not us. Those are the, that, those are the creedal traditions. I was using the Catholics and okay, Protestants right. as an example of creedal. No, but and I mean, then, on that statement, there's the thing that you're referencing, the seven things, but mm -hmm. there's also an, another thing. Am I correct? Or am I so there correct? are seven principles and right. six sources. And the sources are basically saying, here's where we get our inspiration. So one of the things, one of the six, yes, is Judeo-Christian texts, um, world religious wisdoms, earth-based spirituality, um, science and reason, all of that is listed within the six sources. So again, the seven principles are, are guided guiding principles. They're covenantal. They're saying, this is how um, I, Kim, will be in the world with Angelo, with myself, with the larger world, with the universe. They, it, All right. So let me interrupt you. So sure. you're, 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 in a, you're in a train station. Yeah. And um, somebody comes up to you. Yes. And you tell them, I'm a you, you, yeah. whatever. You got like yeah, what's my you elevator got 30, speech? Yeah, what is your elevator? So, <laughs> and I want to really want. I understand that there's all this history that we could talk about probably for hours. Okay, I just want to make sure that the listeners were understanding right. what the starting point is before I get to my <laughs> elevator speech. You are not the person on the train. Okay, so no, I want to know what it is for you. Yeah, which is different from all those words. Well, uh, so what's hard about this is I need to know who you are in order to answer that question. So if you're a complete stranger and you see that I'm wearing my chalice necklace and somebody says, you know, what is that? I say, oh, it's, um, it is the symbol of my faith, Unitarian Universalism. Oh, well, what is that? Well, I would respond with, were, were you raised a particular religion? Okay. Well, if that person says, yes, I'm Christian of whatever you know, sort. Um, then I would say, well, um, Christianity is Trinitarian. It means you believe in three part God figure, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are Unitarian. For us, it means that God or the divine, the spirit is oneness, that there's wholeness in that. It's not, um, Right. And, and that Jesus is prophet or teacher, but, uh, and has divinity, but no more divinity than we, than any part of creation does. The universalist part is about universal salvation. Um, for me, this is where I'm at home in the universalism. Um, <laughs> the historical universalists would talk about how there is a love that is so great that you can't escape it. Mm -hmm. You have no choice but to be loved. So, so be loved. You're going to, you're going to muck it up a million times along the way, return to it, know that you will always be, get, be returned to it. Um, so for some people, that universalism is about an afterlife, but for Unitarian Universalists, that universalism is about creating it in this life. The work is always um, 
paying attention to the life that we've been given using the gifts that are unique to each of us and to the uniqueness of each community that exists and seeing that come um, to play purposefully in the world for the betterment of the whole. So the Unitarian piece is, is important, but not as much so for me, um, except that Unitarian Universalism as a, as a holistic tradition. So it's a container tradition. and people can come at it from the other side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. So you're with a group of clerics, which you, it's probably part of what you do. You're, maybe you're all doing something. And um, maybe this is a hard question, but when, when you think of yourself in relationship to all these other clerics, mm -hmm. many of whom are Christian, they could be Jane, they can be... Um, what, do you, what, 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 what sort of stands out as a distinguishing thing for you when you think about how you do yourself versus how they do themselves? Hmm. Um, do you mean how I do ministry or how I'm holding myself in that particular space? What? How you're holding yourself as a minister versus how they hold themselves as a minister. Um, and maybe there's no distinction. It, it, it's entirely contextual. Okay. So I think that my being a young female lesbian all plays a, a short <laughs> white um, cisgender, like all of those pieces of me play a role in how I enter a room and how I'm in relationship with somebody who is of the same demographic or different. Makes sense. And um, if nothing else, I, I try to be um, respectful of and learning of what that person is looking for in, um, in our interaction before I assume it. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Well, let's get into that, which, which you, which you just referenced. Uh, as I understand it, you came into your, your ministry rather late, at least as for the, the formal aspect of it. And I could be wrong, but you can correct me. Sure. But it, around the same time, it was, it was after the time that you came out as a lesbian woman. Am I correct? First of all, uh, uh, no, my, my formation was actually, um, the quickest it can be. So I went from high school to college to okay. seminary to a call. And when, when did coming out occur? Um, my relationship to that junior and senior year of college. Okay. So, so basically you've been carrying these, these, these identities, both of which obviously are important for you, both as a cleric among clerics and as a minister to a predominantly heterosexual religious community. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, it's, this seems like a, a hard question to, to even um, pose, but, but, but what is it like carrying those identities? You mentioned like being in a, in a, in a, in a room with other clerks and how it's contextual sometimes. Mm -hmm. And they see you as a short person, <laughs> you know, a white person. And if they know anything about you, you, and you, they probably have some, something in their head mm -hmm. about you being a lesbian woman. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, as, what is it like to carry that? Mm. In Unitarian Universalist spaces, it's not something it's not that I carry issue. at all, right? right? Um, but certainly when I'm in an interfaith spaces, um, I find that the closet is readily available to me if I, <laughs> um, if I wish to use it, which I try not to, of course. Um, right. So when I'm in interfaith spaces, many of my clergy colleagues are coming out of their, their serving spaces and they are loyal to and in love with texts and authorities that say that my life and my relationships are not good, not worthy, um, and, you know, and, and wrong, not just not good. So, um, it's one thing to enter a space as a woman in an interfaith, um, environment, interfaith, interfaith community, and know that I'm already going to have to be fighting for some authority in a predominantly male space, predominantly male, middle age, if not older space. So just recently, um, I had an interaction with a colleague of a different denomination, and it was not the most warm interaction. <laughs> um uh, primarily because the first question after introducing myself was, um, well, it alluded, it, it was a question that, that asked how long I had been in ministry. And when I answered, that was the end of the conversation. And maybe I'm reading too much into it, but the fact that I bring in a level of defensiveness into the space just shows that I'm entering into 
um, that the age gap, that the gender gap is already a, a, a starting point that, that feels difficult for me. I'm looking for legitimacy wherever I can find it. Then when people ask about my husband or, you know, some version of that, and I have to correct and say my wife, or if I, you know, if I feel myself retreating into that closet that I detest, um, those are all things that take me off my game, that delegitimize my humanity, certainly take away my authority from, um, as, as somebody who knows how to, how to, you know, be with people and, and do this job in a way that I'm proud of. So, um, it's very messy. It's very uncomfortable and it's a lot of work that I honestly wish wasn't, didn't get in the way because there's more important work to do, especially across the interfaith. And it doesn't go away. Spaces. It's no, just like a constant. Well, so it doesn't go away, but what I've seen in the last 10 plus years of doing this is that um, there are more women in ministry. Uh, when I was in seminary, uh, a friend of mine said, look, God's calling the queer women of color. So people have just got to get used to seeing <laughs> us, right? Um, that's going to be uncomfortable for congregations. And um, so I don't feel, you know, one is I'm 10 years older than I was when I started this. So I was, you know, I was 10 years younger, which if you can imagine, um, I was even younger than I am today. Um, so I, I see more peers now than I did before. And I hope that through my presence, other young women will see more peers as well. So I try to show up, but it is added work that isn't always invited. Yeah, well. It's not the same, but just as a black person or a person of color, yeah. it's it's there every day. Absolutely. You know? yeah. Except that I get to choose a closet if I want to. No. Yeah. I can't. And that's a privilege that I have. Right? Well, thank you for pointing that out. Now, as you know, in the UU Church in general, and I don't know the specifics, but there's been a lot of conversation and even controversy about how to respond to what I'll call the diversity imperative mm -hmm. or the responsibility. <coughs> excuse me of an organization that resides in an increasingly multi multicultural world. What is your take on how the church should respond? And maybe another way of asking it is, what is your take on how you as a Caucasian American individual should respond? Mm. <laughs> uh, so I just want to lift up how the UUA has been responding to it. So, um, Angela, what you're responding to in, in brief is... In April, I think, of this past year, there was a hiring controversy where, um, once again, a, a white man was chosen over a Latina woman for a, a high a high position. And to think that that was the only hiring controversy, of course, would be foolish. But this was an opportunity. This was this was a moment in which the um, the denomination lay and different types of leadership came together and named this as something that must finally be addressed within the system. Um, and that has caused a whole bunch of, of um, turmoil in the system, um, but purposeful and beautiful responses mm -hmm. as well. Um, and, and I'm proud of this congregation that has responded with health as, as part of that. Um, so what should we should what should I be doing? I, that was the question. Yes. Well, that's the second question. Yeah, and, okay. and uh, I'm I'm happy that you you did speak to the organizational piece. Um, so the other piece is a personal piece, just just as a ally. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first is that I have to model continued learning, mm -hmm. and one of the biggest areas of heartache um, that we experienced as Unitarian Universalists during the last five or so months, six months. Um, is that the UUA president in, in really not behaving in ways that we would have hoped, not responding in ways that we would have hoped. Um, he left his post a few months before he would have been done with, with his presidency anyway. And, and the best response that I, I saw and that I echoed, um, was that we needed to see a leader stay in a position after not having a perfect response, mm. needing to apologize, staying in relationship, modeling learning, showing what it, it is to ask for forgiveness, to mm. grow and learn, and, and to show us what that looks like faithfully. Mm. I have and will have ample opportunities to do that in my position as well. Um, so what I try to do, at least as the minister here serving this congregation, is to be a part of the conversations, to um, show up when and where 
I can and where I'm invited to, um, to listen intently, to pay attention to how my body's responding and be curious about that. Um, and then, and then show the white folks in this space that we can do this and that we should be because, because this is not only what our faith says, but this is what our humanity calls us to. I mean, we are, I believe, I believe NPR reported recently that we are the whitest denomination in the country. Now there's a whole, I have a whole host of you know, <laughs> reasons for why I think that is. Um, but that's, that's where we are. And so we, we, um, prioritize whiteness, mm-hmm. not only in, um, what we expect to see, but in how we behave. Um, so if I'm not willing to be taught or to be, um, uncomfortable in, in trying new ways of expression or storytelling or, or uh, music or worship or, or anything. Um, well then we're not going to go anywhere. So I, I have to model that. Um, I have to be a part of that, that process. I was so impressed and I wasn't here when it happened. Um, I listened a little bit to the sermon that you gave. Um, we don't need to go into the sort of the particulars, but, but basically, uh, he, you talk to the congregation about white privilege, mm-hmm. and you also talk to them about how you get you get it that people don't really want to um, address this issue. <laughs> and um, as a person of color, um, hearing about that, uh, it was a, enormously affirming. Mm-hmm. So I was just wondering what what the what was the process like for you, and what was the, the sort of like the re- the reaction from? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of different types of reaction. Um, so let's start with what was a process like yeah, for you? Yeah. I mean, this, this wasn't just in leading up to the sermon, but certainly, and we had stronger language than privilege, but we can talk about it another time. Um, I guess the thing that I'm always holding, the question I'm always holding is why would I be prioritizing this this white person's anxiety over this person of color's life and, um, who, what am I risking? Who am I risking in not being willing to say what I know? This congregation has hired me, has entrusted me to hold the pulpit with, and them with respect and dignity And every time that I have to wonder if my ministry will be okay after a sermon, um, I know that I'm prioritizing the wrong thing. And so I try not to preach from that space. I try to preach from the place of, I trust these people. I love them. Um, I believe in them. And so I'm going to, I'm going to say faithfully what I believe we all need to hear or sit with or work through um, right. To be respectful to all of us, Mm -hmm. to honor all of us. Now, what I'll say is one of my hard learnings in this is in doing so, I have yet to learn the craft of not talking to white people. Um, that wasn't very articulate, but what I mean by that is when I'm talking about privilege or whiteness or anything like I'm, I'm in, um, I don't want to say I'm in an education mode, but I am. Preaching. What's that? It's sort of pre- preachy. Preaching, yeah. You're like higher, down, talking down something. <laughs> oh, I hope I'm not talking well, down. No, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to help you find yeah. the right words. Um, uh, but I am then speaking to white people, and that removes folks of color from the space of worship. Mm-hmm. And that has been challenging to, to try to figure out how to name these um, needs in our congregation, in our world, um, in our country. (laughs) And, um, and as a white person also be speaking to the folks of color who need, who need a word on Sunday, that's not just telling white people, Hey, we need to be better. Well, I'll tell you from my, from my point of view, we're appreciative that you are doing it. Because all too often, it's us that have to do it. Yeah. Us that have to do the education. We're tired of it. Yes. We're tired of it. So when we, we see this white woman doing it, yeah. um, it isn't like, it's like, amen, sister. Uh, we applaud what you did. We, we weren't feeling left. 
well, I wasn't there, so I should, I should. But I can imagine if I were there, I'm saying, go ahead, sister. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> speak to power. You know, speak it. You know, I don't need to be there in that. Uh, you know, in a way, you're you're doing work that you're taking a cross, if you pardon the Christian expression, off of my shoulder, mm. and uh, you're bearing it for me. And we're we're just tremendously appreciative. You know, of you as an ally. Um, so I'll say that on behalf of myself. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, let's talk about a little bit about privilege, which I think is a very interesting um, thing, Mm -hmm. because it's very easy for us to be progressive and say, yeah, "Yeah, you know, white privilege, black privilege, all that stuff. But, you know, it's like it's another thing to own our own. Mm -hmm. This is my sense. Mm -hmm. So both of us are members of identity groups that give us a perspective on the sometimes unconscious privilege that a majority group members and the majority group members enjoy. In my case, I find that as a male, I'm still learning about the ramifications of male privilege, mm-hmm. and it's painful to do so. Mm-hmm. And it's an ongoing learning, and I'm not there yet. And I'm wondering about your perspective on privilege and what has happened to give you insights into it, both as a member and non-member of a privileged group. Mm. <laughs> Uh, so I'll hone in into, into two spaces here. Um, both have to do with my, my being a lesbian. Um, I remember what it was to be straight, (laughs) 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 meaning I remember what it was like to move through the world without ever having to think about what I was doing with whom, in what spaces, um, introducing him to family, friends, like it just was never a thought in the world and just dreaming of like, Oh, maybe this is the guy and here's how our wedding would look. And you know, like all these very normal um, unfoldings. And then of course I remember what came after. And um, so that's an interesting shift to have to be able to, as a young adult, really mark the moment where I moved from one space to another. Um, and to be able to, you know, consciously watch my relationship relationships shift, um, and my own heart because of that, you know, what I was going to allow and how I was going to participate and, and all of that. Um, and then the other space is that I hope she doesn't mind me mentioning this, but my wife grew up in a very, very, very different context than me. Um, we have very completely different <laughs> class backgrounds. Um, I grew up very privileged and she did not, um, to say the least on both ends. And so I find that we are, um, I think we surprise one another in simple moments like, you know, our child's two and I'm like, throw something together for his Halloween costume. He doesn't know any better, but that's because I don't ever have to, I've never had to be self-conscious about how people would perceive my place in the world. So if something looks shabby on my kid, I know it's not going to affect his identity for a couple of hours. Right. But that's not what her reality has been. Um, there's an importance in making sure that he is seen in a certain way and received in a certain way. Um, so in some ways I have been for the last, at least almost decade with Tara, um, we've been living in a cross-cultural household (laughs) and having to navigate that and share decision-making based off of that. And then of course my own identity and then just the learning, the constant learning around race, um, I have grown up in and been a part of other than seminary and my three and a half years in New York city, I've been in very white spaces. Mm-hmm. I've had very, very, very dear friends who are people of color, but, um, you know, but that's not, that's not the same. <laughs> I so appreciate you bringing t- Tara into it and the class background. Mm-hmm. I have the same exact dynamic in different ways with my wife mm-hmm. who's from a very privileged background and I'm privileged from the, point of view of being middle class um but i didn't live next to the governor Uh uh-huh. okay know, neither did i, I. <laughs> <laughs> well that sounds fascinating <laughs> that's a topic for another yes. time <laughs> now i alluded to um your your sermon um about you, you didn't use white privilege i used it mm. but about whiteness to the congregation um 
my own feeling, it's a very difficult message for white people to hear. Do you have the same impression? Is and if so, why do you think it is? Yeah, of course, I absolutely do. I mean, I think I think if you look out in the world, especially in our country right now, um, that would answer your your question more perfectly than that. Um, why is that? Because our country is born of a supremacy perspective and whiteness has always been the thing that has been, um, has been, has been the, the priority has been the power and, um, and it has been abused from, that is the narrative, that is the, the way that our country has been built and, um, has expressed itself. And so as we take these conversations finally more seriously, these lives, bodies, families more seriously, look back at our history, be honest about that for the first time in our lives, some of us, um, it is threatening to who we believe we are in the world, especially for progressives, because we think that by voting for a certain person or having our work is done, exactly walking into a certain congregation, um, um, holding whatever identity in that way uh, by donating to a certain charity, right? We are we are good, and um, we are not practiced or what's the language for this? Um, we are not taught that that failing or stumbling, even uh, let alone having a, a life rich with microaggressions or macroaggressions could equate to goodness. And and we don't know how to live if we are not good, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything, goodness is bound up in worth, bound up in, in worthiness Mm -hmm. is bound up in, in uh, acceleration into the next class. I mean, it's all just wrapped up. And, and if we talk about then who is deserving of what, Mm -hmm. right? There's just, there's so much here. And uh, and white people, especially, we've never been given the story um, that we deserve anything less. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so the second that you tell me that I've got privilege that is unearned and yet used mm-hmm. constantly, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm going to feel threatened by that, right? And then if you add on to that, because because I think what's necessary in this conversation, too, is that we're never... Today, in today's world, we're not just talking about whiteness. We're talking about white, heteronormative, yes. cisgender, Patriarch. patriarchy, capitalism, right? right? It's all bound up in the same thread. Mm-hmm. And if you pull one, mm-hmm. yeah, we're, we're mm-hmm. touching on a lot of, yeah. a lot of stuff and a lot of fragility. Yeah. Because, um, you were here this past Sunday. I talked a, a, a titch about, sort of uh, the roles were, were given to play, to speak generally about it. And um, I think maleness and heteronormativity and whiteness are all roles that we've been given. Mm-hmm. And we work really hard to live into those roles. And it, it's, um, uh, what is that phrase? I'm going to lose it right now. Um, Okay, I'm gonna have to drop it because fine. I can't think of what it is. The complex when you somebody is gonna listen and try to scream it into the radio. Um, imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm trying to get at. And so if we touch on one, the whole identity is going to unravel. And then that brings us back to the earlier part of the my answer, my rambling answer of um, if that unravels, what else is going to unravel? Who am I? Exactly. Who am I? Am I worthy? Right. Sorry, was that good? No, it's just, <laughs> was I'm, that just, I'm, just, I'm just look, I'm looking for a way to shift. I, I did want to get to these, these other two things because, sure. you know, um, as you know, we live in just incredibly adver- adversarial political climate right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't remember anything like this in my entire lifetime. So the question for me that I ask myself every day What is your personal sense as to how to engage politically, while at the same time being open to people who don't share our beliefs? They share our humanity, but they don't share our beliefs. Mm -hmm. I want want a magic bullet here, Kim. How do we do that? (laughs) 
Because to me, that's that's a critical thing. Yeah. For me, I know what racism is, mm -hmm. but this whole them versus us thing, to me, it's just as pernicious mm -hmm. as vicious racism, vicious sexism. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lose her last name, but Ruby... Oh, um, Not Ruby Tuesday. Sorry. No. <laughs> um, there is an African-American woman, civil rights leader, who's still um, a major voice today, Ruby sales. I wouldn't say but that's not her last name. And she has, she's, she's well known for her question of asking, where does it hurt? And how as Americans we have, either we've never had it or we've lost our ability to ask, where does it hurt? Mm -hmm. And I think until we start with the pain, we are stuck here. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't mean to say that as a uh, sounding cynical. Um, for me, there's that's the shared humanity piece, mm -hmm. um, and I can't look at the world. I can't look at you know my extended family without mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that softens me to the world and to my extended family is is being able to say, "Look at the pain. Mm -hmm. Look where where does it hurt?" Because we share that. Yeah. No matter what we believe, we share mm -hmm. that. The mm -hmm. Buddhists start there. Yeah. And I think what's so challenging about that is, first of all, is that we're so deeply protective of that. Like, because of the cultural climate that we're, that we're in, or we are in the cultural climate we are in because we refuse to show the world the pain that we have. Mm. We've built up all of these protections and presentations in order to make sure nobody knows that that's what we've got. Um, and at the same time, you and I have had brief conversations about this. We're moving further and further away from communities that encourage us to turn inward um, and, and sit with or reflect on the grief that we're holding mm. and to, and to build communities around that, to build rituals around honoring how deeply, um, we hurt mm. and to honor that and, and call it sacred. I mean, don't believe in God. I don't, that doesn't bother me. <laughs> I, you know, I probably don't believe in the God you don't believe in too. Um, that's not the point. What, what has worth your grief? Because it's, it's shifting the world that we are in. It's, mm -hmm. it's tearing us apart. And, um, you know, we don't even want to go to therapy, let alone church anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. So I can't remember how long ago it was now, but there was an article that came out a couple of years ago talking about how Americans, uh, yeah, yeah, somebody should fact check me on this, but it was some tiny, 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 um, number, like every American can claim one person in their life whom they are close to, mm. who they would share a secret with. Mm. And I don't even know if it's like one per, it's you know, I don't know if it's a one-to-one, yeah. one. um, but it was stark Yeah, it is stark. to think about how we are living, even in community, such isolated lives. Mm. And why is that? Mm. Because of the pain that we're afraid to show. And again, it goes back to worth. What will happen to us if we dare show somebody that we don't have it all together who will love us who will love us will we still you know what will they think of all the perfect facebook pictures that i put <laughs> out of my family mm. you know it's a tough time right now in a lot of respects and um i would like to know the things that you do every day to keep yourself balanced and grounded in in spirit you think I'm balanced and grounded? <laughs> <laughs> to a degree that you do. Uh, what do you do yeah. to keep yourself together? I mean, I find people I can laugh with. That's the first thing. You know, I, I, especially being in ministry and um, really sort of having a revolving door in which I'm I'm with people who who are struggling in different ways. It can be very easy to um, forget that the world is also very light. Mm. And, and doesn't always take itself seriously. And, um, right. Yeah. That, yeah, that people aren't always in grief. Yeah. Um, so I watch a ridiculous amount of the office. <laughs> on <laughs> <repeat>. <laughs> and, um, I spend time with, with my family mm. and, um, 
having a two year old is, <laughs> is is unbelievably exhausting and also the greatest gift in a world. You know, it's the same thing that can set you into a spiral of despair. Of, you know, what, what have I done bringing a child into this world, and how do I make sure that he's going to be the best thing that this world can can have? Um, that he's not just a consumer of the planet, mm-hmm. but that he returns. Um, but he's also just such a joy, mm-hmm. like to watch life be curious mm-hmm. rather than confrontational to, to watch him learn and wonder and laugh and, you know, it's, and, and to see all of our adult emotions packed into this two year old body. Like, of course he's flailing on the ground. He didn't get the thing he wants. Do you know how many people I interact with who do the exact same thing, just in a different, like less obvious version? And I, and I do the same. I'm not, you know, I'm trying to say it's anybody, everybody else but me, but it's a good reminder that we're all just these tiny little people living in adult sized bodies. Kim, this has been a privilege. And before I sort of wrap it up, I just want to take a moment of silence here just to acknowledge and allow, us, allow all that's been said to sink in, maybe just for the you as an immediate listener, and those of you in your family or those of you in extended networks, let's just take a, just a second and just allow it to just a second of silence and allow it, allow it to sink in. And again, I want to thank you, Reverend Kim, for uh, sharing your words with us today and being my guest in my podcast or our podcast. And um, for those of you that enjoy the podcast and would like to support it further, there's this thing called Patreon that would enable you, if you want, to be, in effect, a sponsor of the podcast for as little as a dollar a month. There are other certain prerequisites that you can get for higher levels of support. You can just merely go to patreon.com, look for the Diversity and Spirituality Network podcast and find out more. And please have a light and blessed day and try to speak to somebody who's a little bit different from you and experience the love that you both share. What is diversity? What is diversity? What is diversity? What is spirituality?